Hey, welcome everybody. And uh, this is going to be our annual Cyber Monday. Can you believe it? Our annual Cyber Monday webcast. And today's topic is going to be, honestly, it's on my favorite track of all the different Cisco tracks. And that's collaboration. Now, of course, I'm a huge fan of the enterprise track, and I've, I've got uh, I've got some interest in uh, the security track a little bit, and I've done some things in the data center track. But really, collaboration, that's really where my passion is. And in today's session, which I'm guessing is going to run about one to two hours, we're going to give you the fundamentals of Cisco collaboration. We're going to show you the pieces and parts that make up a collaboration network. And we're not going to get into any configuration today. We just want to talk about the theory of how does everything work together? How do we take human speech, for example, and convert that into binary? How do we convert what's coming out of my mouth into ones and zeros? We'll discuss that, as well as a lot of the different servers, a lot of the different services that Cisco makes available to us. Now, for those of you watching this on replay later on on YouTube, I just want to let you know that we're doing this right now in front of a live audience and we're being joined on my website. We've got people on LinkedIn and Facebook and YouTube and all over. So I'm going to be checking the chats from time to time there. But uh, everybody with me here live today, first of all, welcome. Thank you for being here live. I appreciate it. And I'd like to know your experience, if you wouldn't mind sharing, with collaboration. Is it brand new to you? Have you been working with collaboration for a while? Do you, do you have a little exposure? Just kind of give me a sense for where you are. That's going to help me kind of gauge where the audience is as we get into today's discussion. So we've got some people logged into the chat role on my website. And we've got some people on Facebook, some people on LinkedIn. Let's see. Oh, we've got, uh, let's see. Uh, Jaron says, I'm actually a voice engineer. So, uh, so awesome, awesome. We've got some great experience. Let's see. CCNP, but really no experience with collaboration. We've got some newbies. Somebody had the uh, the, pr uh, the prior CCNA voice. Steve uh, Steve is saying that. So we've got people all over the board, it would appear. Let me just check our... Nobody on LinkedIn has chimed in yet with their response. But um, hey, wherever you are, welcome. I think, you'll have, uh, have, I think you'll have some fun today if you have any interest at all in the world of collaboration. Here's the agenda. Here's what's coming up today. We're going to get started after this uh, introduction. We're going to get started by taking a look just briefly at traditional telephony networks because we're building up to uh, we're building up to working with this guy, something like this. This is a Cisco 8865 IP phone. Notice not only is it a phone, it's got the it's got the camera, it's got a high resolution uh, high resolution camera. We've got this great display on it. But before we were there, no kidding, I, I found this and I wanted to share it with you. This is the actual phone that uh, my family had when I was growing up. This phone is older than I am. It's the old uh, rotary dial phone. Remember how you used to dial like that? Well, we'll talk about how we started here and how we got, and how we got up to these IP phones that we have today. And the magic behind the scenes, we'll pull back the curtain and see how all that works. And we said we would talk about how voice gets digitized. How do I speak, have that represented digitally, and not take up too much bandwidth? What is the sweet spot, uh, sweet spot for how much bandwidth a voice call should take up? We'll talk about that. Then we'll get into Cisco's Unified Communications components. The star of the show, by the way, is a Cisco Unified Communications Manager. We'll talk about the messaging solution of Cisco Unity Connection. And because this is Cyber Monday, this is our like once a year event. We have the, the Black Friday through Cyber Monday sales event where we go live a couple of times and we offer our biggest discounts, our biggest sale of the year. And um, for those of you attending live, I encourage you to stay live because uh, we're going to be giving you some offers. And if you're watching this on replay, I will have edited out all that stuff because it won't apply to you. The sale is going to be over. But uh, for those of you live, stick around because I've got some special stuff for you that are attending live and, and only those of you that are attending live. But then we'll take some Q&A. want to answer some questions before we dive into some other components. We'll talk about the, uh, the IMP, the Instant Messaging and Presence Server, that kind of works hand in hand with Communications Manager. We'll talk about some of the different IP phone models, including the one I just showed you. Cisco Telepresence, that is Cisco's, that's their immersive solution where you really feel like you're there. Uh, we'll talk about Cisco Expressway and how it lets us have somebody out on the internet, maybe on their, maybe on their smart device, running the Cisco Jabber app. 
and they can come in and register with the communications manager server back at the headquarters through a firewall. That's what that's what that's what this expressway lets us do. It gives us firewall traversal. It gives us NAT traversal. We'll talk about traditional Cisco routers and how they can play a role as gateways in this network. We'll talk about Cisco Unity Connection. We'll talk about uh, actually. We've already talked about Cisco Unity Connection. I meant for that to be, I meant for that to say Cube, the Cisco Unified Border Element. We'll talk about Communications Manager Express and we'll talk about Cisco Unity Express. So the big players, we're gonna talk about all of those today. And again, we'll review the, the offers because there's a, it, it ends today. So I wanna give you one last opportunity to take advantage of those Black Friday, Cyber Monday deals. And there's a bunch of them this year with all of Cisco's new curriculum they dropped earlier this year. We'll take some Q&A and we'll wrap up. Again, my guess is it's going to run about two hours, just so you can work that into your schedule if you can. For those of you that don't know me, you just kind of stumbled across this. Here's my super quick bio. And uh, again, my name is Kevin Wallace. I've got a couple of CCIEs. Uh, let's see, coming up next year, we'll make my 20th anniversary as a CCIE. I've got one in enterprise infrastructure and one in collaboration. And I've been working with Cisco Gear since 1989, since the very first Cisco router. Does anybody remember the old Cisco AGS Plus router? I had two of those where I worked, and I used to work on those. I taught Cisco courses for Cisco Learning Partners for about 14 years, and then I started my own training company. I've been doing this now for over six years with uh, Kevin Wallace Training, or KW Train. Uh, real world experience includes being a network designer. I was one of five network designers down at Walt Disney World in Florida. In fact, the, the coolest project I got to do, I got I was the guy that got to design the network that tied together the Magic Kingdom and Epcot and the studios and Animal Kingdom and a bunch of the resorts. And uh, if you ever join me in one of my uh, live courses, I talk a lot about um, some Disney stories and, and how, how things work behind the scenes there. Written a bunch of books. I, I think it's around 16 or so. I kind of lost count with Cisco Press done a bunch of video courses for them. I was honored to speak at Cisco Live a couple of times and was uh, got some awards for that. Bottom line is, I, I'm passionate about this stuff. I've lived and breathed Cisco for over three decades. This is my favorite track. I cannot wait to get started and share some of this with you. And my hope is, if this track is right for you, you're going to come out of today thinking, you know, I never really considered it, but yeah. Yeah, I'm going to start going down the collaboration track, and I want to help you take your next step, your next step down that track. Now, I said I was really passionate about this. It's really in my blood, literally. I, I, I put this picture in my slide deck this morning. I thought you you would enjoy this one. No kidding. This is me at um, at four months of no three months of age. This is me at. No, actually, this is me at four months of age. Uh, I'm in a telephone central office. There's my dad. He uh, he was a central office uh, supervisor at our GTE telephone company for many, many years. And uh, you can see my milk bottle being warmed on a soldering iron in the background. Those of you that go back in the world of telephony, this is an old step-by-step -step Stroger switch with all the clicking and clacking. And I kind of grew up in and around a telephony environment. So I just love this stuff. Kind of grew up with it. So let's talk about traditional telephony networks for a moment. The way businesses traditionally did telephony was they didn't want to buy a phone line for every phone that they had. For example, I used to work at a university. I managed their phone network. And I think we had like 6,000, 6,500 or so phones on campus. Do you think we went out and bought 6,000 lines from the phone company, one line per phone? That would be a big phone bill, wouldn't it, at the end of the month? But statistically, you recognize not everybody is using the phone at the same time. You only have a certain percentage of people using the phone at the same time. You can do a traffic study and you can determine statistically what's going to be the right number of lines for you. And then you can buy something, a business or our university bought a $3 million PBX, a private branch exchange. That's a privately owned phone system. And that allowed us to have, I think we had about originally about 210 phone lines coming in from the telephone company. And that will be that was being shared by over 6,000 phones. And it worked fine because not everybody was using the phone for an outgoing call at the same time. So that gave us a tremendous cost savings in that device. Again, it's called a PBX, a private branch exchange. 
Now, if you're calling in from your home traditionally, you still have a landline. I'm just curious, how many people have, uh, have just gone solely to cell phones? You no longer have a landline. Go ahead and say, yep, that's me. Go ahead and put that in the, uh, in the chat if you would. Go ahead and chat that, uh, chat that in. Somebody says, yep, you were born to do tech. I love it, <laughs> somebody said. Yeah, I really think I was. Uh, yeah, a lot of people have been cutting the line. Yeah, a lot, we're getting flooded with people saying, yep, we cut the lines. We're just, uh, we're just cell phone only now. I am as well. But traditionally, you would have like a phone like this, and you would have what was called a, uh, you would call, have a connection called the local loop that would get you back to your local CO, your local telephone company central office. And you would pick up the handset, and there would be 48 volts, negative 48 volts of DC across a couple of wires in this phone called the tip and ring wires. When you went off hook, it closed a circuit, and current started to flow, and that's what gave you dial tone. Well, that was how it worked for individual users in their home, but we talked about these PBXs that companies had. Well, these PBXs, they would connect into the telephone company using uh, central office trunks a grouping of lines. Like I said, the university, we had a little over 200 lines going to, the, uh, going to the central office. Some of those were individual lines, or some of those were digital lines. We had like T1 circuits, as an example. And with those T1 circuits, you could have, a, depending on how you have it set up, 23 or 24 simultaneous phone calls over one circuit. But that's the way that I have pictured for you on screen that telephony has worked for years. And let's talk about the types of signaling that we had in traditional telephony, and we're going to see how that relates to unified communications because we still have signaling. We'll be using signaling protocols uh, in unified communications. First of all, there is supervisory signaling. For example, when I go off hook and I hear a dial tone, that is giving me uh, that is giving me some information that I have gone uh, off hook. That would be information signaling. When I when I dial a digit, when I dial a digit, that would be address signaling. I'm addressing somebody. Supervisory signaling is when I signal the central office that I've gone off hook. That presence of loop current tells the telephone company that I have gone off hook. Give them dial tone. Be on the lookout for dial digits coming in. Now let's answer a paradox here. I said that this phone had a couple of wires going into it, the tip and ring wires, which by the way, historical note, uh, re remember, uh, do you remember the old Andy Griffith show? Did you ever watch that one uh, with, uh, with Andy and he, when he would call, want to call Floyd at the barbershop, Andy would uh, just pick up this handset and he would call Sarah, the operator, and Sarah would connect Andy with Floyd. The way Sarah did that is she had this little plug. It looks sort of like a one of those full-size stereo plugs that she would plug in a switchboard. Well, the tip of that connector uh, was where we get the name tip. And there was a ring, and then there was the sleeve. So tip, ring, sleeve. That old operator term, the old switchboard term, that's where we get tip and ring for, from. But I said that when we go off hook, loop current starts to flow. So here's the paradox. If the circuit is open while I'm on hook, how can my phone ring? How, how can I send voltage through a, an open circuit? And on screen, you see the answer. There's, a, there's an electrical component called a capacitor. Now, a capacitor, if you've studied electronics, it will block direct current, but it will allow alternating current to get through. So ringing voltage, that's alternating current. So the alternating current, it will get to the ringer, but when you go off hook, that closes the circuit for the direct current to start to flow. And uh, that's when the telephone company says, oh, they just went off hook. I better stop, stop sending this ringing voltage, which can be about 90 volts, which uh, you can feel, by the way, if you've ever been rung into. I, I certainly have a time or two. And the way we used to dial with this kind of phone specifically, we were talking about address signaling. We used pulse signaling. So if I went off hook and, for example, I dialed the number three, what I would do is I would rotate down and I would let go. And it, as you were hearing that noise, of it was returning to its starting position. What was happening is that circuit, that tip and ring circuit, it was being opened and closed in rapid succession three times. 
to represent the number three. So when I go off hook, current is flowing. When I dial the number three, briefly, there's a certain time where it's like a few tenths of a, uh, like a, a fraction of a second. It's go about a tenth of a second, actually. It's going to go off, uh, not really off hook or on hook. It's going to open the circuit and then rapidly close it back. It's going to go open, close, open, close, open, close three times. And that rapid succession of opens and closures, that tells the telephone central office that, uh, hey, they just dialed a three. In fact, here's a cool trick. I used to do this when I was a kid. Uh, I would call my neighbor up the street and I would try to do it without dialing the phone. I would just tap the hook switch. I would go, and I, I would try to get the, the timing just right. And a, a percentage of the time, it didn't always work, but a percentage of the time it did work. That's the way that signaling used to work. Of course, it got a lot more advanced, a lot more efficient with the introduction of DTMF, dual tone multi-frequency. Because when you press, when you press a button on a touch tone phone, like you press the number five, for example, you're actually, you're actually sending two simultaneous frequencies. That's why it's called dual tone and you're sending multi-frequencies. You press the number five and it's simultaneously sending uh, 1,336 hertz and 770 hertz. And the telephone switching equipment or an FXS port in a Cisco router, they'll recognize that those simultaneous frequencies and it will interpret that that you just dial the five in fact when we talk about dtmf it's not just used for dialing digits it's also used it's also used for for your dial tone when you're listening to dial tone that's a solid dtmf tone and when you hear ring back you call somebody and you hear it goes and you, uh, that gives you indication that it's ringing on their end, that ring back, that's, that's DTMF as well. I've got a little table here showing you some other times that uh, dual tone multi-frequency shows up. But now that we've briefly talked about how telephony used to work, let's start making the migration to unified communications. And step one of that is just voice over IP. You see, when I used to work at a university, we had uh, remote campuses. And in those remote campuses, we would have like a video network, a, uh, a voice network, and a data network. And those were literally three separate networks. You could go into the wiring closet and you could see, here's the wiring for voice, here's the wiring for video, here's the wiring for data. They were separate networks. But uh, kind of like they said in the field of dreams, if you build it, he will come. It's not they will come. Well, listen carefully, it's he will come. Uh, and... Uh, now we've got these high-speed, highly redundant, highly resilient data networks. Why not send data and voice and maybe even video over a previous data-only network? So what we can do, instead of having a bunch of trunks going out to the PSTN that our PBX is connected to, a baby step towards unified communication is to take those PBXs and connect them in to something like a Cisco router. And the Cisco routers that have a data connection between themselves, they can convert the PBX signaling and the actual voice, it can convert it into signaling protocols that we'll be talking about today, like SIP, like the session initiation protocol. And the voice media itself, it's carried by it's carried by uh, a protocol called RTP, the Real-Time Transport Protocol. And there are a few different ports. I said we could just plug into a Cisco router. Do you plug into an Ethernet port? No, there are special voice ports. There is an FXS port, a foreign exchange station port, and that's where you would connect in a phone. And the, uh, the FXS port, it kind of acts like a telephone office switch because it's going to provide you dial tone. It will interpret your dial digits. The FXO port for an exchange office, you could connect that into the central office. It acts like a phone. The FXO port can basically dial digits. It can send a call. It can receive a call. It can answer an incoming call. And then primarily used just for PBXs, we had e &M. Earth and mouth, ear, ear and magneto, different literature calls it different things. But this is a way for, this is an analog circuit that allowed a PBX uh, to connect in, to connect into a line, like a tie, uh, tie line they were called, that went off to another site. 
okay, that's the way that we can start to move in to unified communications. But now we've got possibly analog waveforms coming from the PBX that we need to send into the router and have the router convert that in to ones and zeros. How do we do voice digitization? Well, there are a few steps involved here. We need to take, here's the end game, we need to take the, uh, the continually fluctuating analog waveform like you see on screen and somehow convert it into digital, convert it into ones and zeros. And the way we can do that is through sampling. If I measure the amplitude, the volume in other words, if I measure the amplitude and the polarity, are we, a, are we a positive value or are we a negative value? If I measure the amplitude and polarity frequently like I'm showing you on screen, it's a game of connect the dots. I just connect all those dots on the other end. If I can represent each dot digitally and I send those digital representations of the dots to the other side, the other router, that other router is just going to play a game of connect the dots. And it's going to it's going to reproduce approximately what that waveform was. It's kind of like when you go to the movies. Uh, you go to the if you still go to the movies, I haven't been to the movies since COVID, but uh, I know some of the movie theaters are still open. But um, you go into the movie theater and you're watching up on the silver screen. Normally, you're watching that movie at about 24 frames per second. You're not watching smooth motion. You're watching 24 still images projected in rapid succession. But it looks like smooth motion. That's kind of what's happening with voice. We're not sending a continuously smooth audio waveform but it sounds like it, approximately, because we're sending all these dots and then we're connecting the dots. But the question is, this is the, this is the big question, how many dots, how many samples do we take per second? With, with the movie, I said uh, it's commonly 24, but on your, your, your smartphone, you might be doing 30 frames a second or 60 frames a second. How many dots, how many samples per second do we need to take with voice? Well, if you don't take enough, like here, I've, I've used too few dots on screen. And if I play a game of connect the dots now, you see that the, the resulting waveform looks absolutely nothing like the original waveform. That's called an alias signal. If you want to take some notes, I'll, I'll point out several terms as we go through today. An alias signal is when we have an insufficient number of samples to accurately reproduce the original signal. So what is that magic number? The magic number comes from a gentleman that uh, was back in the 1920s. He was a college professor. Later, he worked at Bell Laboratories. His name was Harry Nyquist. And he developed what was called, uh, later it was called the Nyquist Theorem. He actually laid the groundwork in the, in the 20s. And then there was another collaborator that helped develop it further in the 30s. And eventually it turned into what we now know as the Nyquist Theorem. But it kind of originated back in the 1920s. And the Nyquist Theorem says this. If you want to represent a waveform based on samples, the minimum number of samples you want to take is twice the highest frequency. What is the highest frequency for voice calls? Well, human ears, they can hear, well, I should say young human ears. If you're, if you haven't listened to a lot of loud music like I did was when I was a teenager, you, uh, a healthy human ear can hear between about 20 Hertz, about 20 cycles per second at the low end to about 20,000 Hertz at the high end. And mine has, I was shocked. I thought I've got perfect hearing, but uh, just the other day, my, uh, one of my daughters and her boyfriend were over and we were talking about this and he had this little thing on his phone. Uh, he plays guitar, so he's got all these little audio things and it would play different frequencies and it was like, okay, tell me when you stop hearing it. And it's like, okay, now. And my daughter's like, really? You don't hear that? Because I think mine dropped out at somewhere like 14 kilohertz or something. But um, the great news is for voice, we're not trying to do Dolby surround sound. We're not trying to get super high fidelity. With voice, we're trying to get 4,000 hertz and below. Because statistically, over 90% of human speech intelligence occurs below 4,000 hertz. So we're going to be able to understand someone just fine if we just represent 4,000 hertz and below. 
So according to Mr. Nyquist, the number of samples we should take is two times 4,000, which is 8,000. We're going to take 8,000 samples per second. And let's say that we take those samples and they look sort of like this. Here's the volume, here's the volume, here's the volume, here's the volume. And we try to assign numbers to this. Now, this is called pulse amplitude modulation to start with. Pulse amplitude modulation or PAM. And this is where we have like a, it's called a carrier frequency. We've got these one, this one frequency that represents all these different volumes and polarities as well. But do you notice an issue here? I've got these numbers and I'm saying if you're anywhere in this range, you're, we're going to give you the number one. If you're in this other range, we're going to give you the number two. If you're in this other range, we're going to give you the number... Do, do you notice that nothing lines up perfectly with the number one or two or three? There's error. You see the little the delta symbol I've got on screen? All of these are a little bit off. And that leads to a problem. By having these slight inaccuracies when we're trying to play this back, it calls what's called quantization noise. It sounds like this, this, this hiss, this tsh, this background hiss. So we don't do it this way. Instead of using a linear scale like this, do you remember back in high school? I don't know if you did this in high school, but in high school, we used to have to go buy uh, graph paper. Uh, the logarithmic graph paper. Remember where you've had like, it was a, a, the powers of tens, like here's one through 10, here's 10 through 100, here's 100 through 1000. It was a logarithmic scale. Well, we use a logarithmic scale when we're sampling voice. In other words, just like on, a, on log graph paper, we're going to be more accurate at lower volumes. That's good for two reasons. Number one, most samples occur at those lower volumes. Number two, the louder volumes are so loud anyway, they tend to drown out that background hiss. So we're all good. So we're going to use a logarithmic scale. And there's a couple of ways that you can do this logarithmic scale. We won't get into it here in, in this brief uh, webcast today, but there's something called G.711U law, or actually it's a mu law, the Greek letter mu, and G.711A law, and they do it a little bit differently, but that, that's a topic for a different day. But we're going to use a logarithmic scale, and we're going to take 8,000 samples per second. The next question is, how many bits are we going to use to represent a sample? And the answer is eight. That's, that's the standard. We're going to use eight because those, um, if, if I go back to the, let me click through here and, and show you that previous log chart again. Notice that we've got different segments. We've got segment zero and segment one. Well, each of those segments are broken into different steps. So we're going to have a polarity bit to say, is this sample a positive voltage? Is it a negative? Uh, what, are the, uh, what are the segments? We represent that with three bits. What are the steps within that segment? We represent that with four bits. And that's going to be a total of eight bits. So now we're, we've gone from a pulse amplitude modulation where we were, still, we, were still, uh, we were still analog into digital. Now we're doing pulse code modulation. We're doing PCM. And here's the way it works. Let's do the math. This is hopefully going to be a familiar number to you. We're going to say that we're taking 8,000 samples per second. How many, how many bits did we say would be per sample? Eight bits. Eight bits times 8,000 samples per second means that we're taking 64,000 bits per second. Those of you that have worked in the telephony world, you probably know that 64K, that's a, that's a really common value that you have. If you take a T1 circuit, for example, it's divided into 24 of those 64 kilobit per second channels. That's how much bandwidth it takes to send uncompressed voice. And if we're sending uncompressed voice in a Cisco Unified Communications Network, the codec or the coder decoder we're using as it's called, the codec is G.711. Now, this is not a comprehensive listing. There's another codec, G.722. You could also do uncompressed sampling with the G.722 codec. But uh, G.711, that's that's one that does not do compression. So while the sound is best with something like that, like G G.711 is the codec, the coder decoder, 
you might want to save bandwidth. You're going over a wide area network link. You might want to conserve some WAN bandwidth. So you may use a codec that has some that, that has some compression. One common one in the Cisco world is G.729. It only takes up 8 kilobits per second of bandwidth as opposed to 64. Now, you've still got to add on the overhead, the layer 2, the layer 3, the layer 4 overhead. But uh, the, the, the media itself, 8 kilobits per second. That's one eighth of what G.711 is taking up. And uh, the resulting bandwidth with the overhead is uh, significantly less, as you see on screen. Now, do we suffer from uh, poor voice quality? Yeah, kinda. Uh, the, the way voice quality is often measured is using a measure called uh, a mean opinion score, an MOS score. And G711 generally has a score of about 4.1. And four is considered toll quality. That's what, you, that's what customers are expecting. That's what they're happy with. G.711 is a, a little better than that. G.729, and there's a few variants of G729, but it's a, it's around, depending on which variant you're using, it's around 3.9 to about 3.2. So it's not quite toll quality, but honestly, if I'm just listening to voice, I, I probably couldn't tell the difference. Now, if you're listening to music on hold, yeah, you can tell the difference because this codec, it was designed for Latin-based speech patterns. It was not designed for music on hold, so it sounds... Music on hold sounds rough, but there's some ways around that that we get into in our, in our Collaboration Core uh, video training series. Another one you might hear is ILBC. That stands for Internet Low Bitrate Codec. It's kind of a compromise. It takes up a little bit more bandwidth, but it sounds on paper anyway, better than G729. So that one is a really popular one. Now that we've talked about how traditional telephony networks work, how we can digitize human speech, now let's start replacing that old PBX with Cisco Unified Communications Components. And we're going to start with the overview. This, I'm going to put a bunch of different components on the screen. If you want to take some notes, we're going to be going into pretty much all of these components in today's discussion. But let's say that I've got a company that wants to have telephone service out to the public switch telephone network, as well as to a remote site. Maybe I've got one or more sales offices, and I want to direct telephone circuit to them. In the old days, the way you would do that is you would, like we did at the university, we would get a tie line. And we would have this tie line between our main campus and this remote campus. And we would pay for that tie line. Well, now we can just have, we, we can have data, whether it's through the internet over a VPN or whether it's some sort of a, a, a private circuit, whether it's MPLS, we could send our voice, video, and data over what was previously just a data-only circuit. So let's start building our, our unified communications network. I'm going to have traditional network infrastructure components, like a router connecting out to the internet. And maybe I've got a switch. And the first big component, I called it earlier, I called it the star of the show. It's the Cisco Unified Communications Manager. And notice, I've got a couple of them here. One's called the pub for the publisher, and one's called the sub for the subscriber. And we'll talk about the difference between those two in a moment, but generally, you want to have, especially in larger environments, you want to have more than just one communications manager server. You want to have more for redundancy. You want to have more for scalability as well. So let's say we've got a couple. For voice messaging, uh, voicemail is one example. We might have a Cisco Unity Connection server, a CUC server. For Jabber clients, that's where we've got that software application like on our, maybe on our tablet or on our phone or on our laptop. We're a remote worker. So many people are remote workers today. How many people right now, chat chat into me if you would, how many are, are, of you are doing work from home right now and, and have been for a while with the whole COVID thing? Anybody, uh, any work from home people? I'm sure we're, we're going to have a bunch. I'm trying to click around and, uh, and yeah, if you're, if you're chatting in questions, I promise we're going to have some dedicated Q&A time a little bit later on. Uh, forgive me if I don't answer your question right now because I, I, I cannot total, I cannot be distracted and keep looking over at the uh, at the question queue. Yeah. Oh yeah. Somebody's been working at home since March. It looks like. Yep. A lot of people. Oh, somebody's back in the office. Okay. Uh, somebody else since March. Another one since March. Yeah. A lot of people working from home these days. It looks like. All right. Well, let's keep going here. Uh, if if you are working from home, I know um, 
I know my daughter is. Uh, and I was over at her apartment and I was looking at her work computer that they sent her. And yeah, she's using Cisco Jabber for her communications uh, in the office. And that's going to give her voice calls, video calls, instant messaging. And that's made possible through this IMP, this instant messaging and present server. And we'll be talking in more detail about that today. And of course, the hardware type of phone that we might have connecting in here, like I showed you earlier, a Cisco, this is a Cisco 8865 phone. There's lots of models out there. That's just, uh, that's my favorite at the moment. It's what I'm working with, with the new course I'm developing. Or we might have that software-based Jabber client. And for meeting environments, we might have telepresence. We'll be talking about that today. That's a more immersive environment. You know, we said we only wanted to support you know, 4,000 hertz and below. Not with telepresence. Telepresence, we're trying to feel like we're really there. We're like on the holodeck on the on the Enterprise. Uh, and it's, it's like CD quality audio. So we are going for those high fidelity audio streams, the telepresence and these big high resolution televisions. But in our networks today, yeah, we're probably going to have a firewall uh, to protect us from all the bad stuff happening on the internet, which, which begs the question, you've got a Jabber client out there on the internet and they want to connect in, they want to register with communications manager or your I am in present server. Generally, the firewall is not going to accept incoming connections like that. So how does that work? I'll explain it later in detail, but it's going to use a couple of Expressway servers. There's an Expressway Edge server that the Jabber client can connect to, and it's going to get us through to the Expressway C server on the inside of our network. That's the, that's the core. And in order for that to work, we're going to be pointing to a couple of different DNS servers, and I've got a slide on that coming up. But uh, that router, it can connect us out to the PSTN, out to the rest of the world. There's another device called a Cube, a Cisco Unified Border Element. And that Cisco Unified Border Element, it's going to tie together a couple of call legs. Uh, for example, if you're going out not to just your regular telephone company, uh, there are companies now called, I, for your notes, an ITSP, an Internet Telephony Service Provider. Not an ISP, an ITSP. You can connect to them via a data connection, and it's their responsibility to have all the T1 circuits and all the circuits going into the telephone central office. You're just connecting to them digitally, well, you're typically going to do that through a Cisco Unified Border Element. Or maybe you're connecting out to a remote site, you often do that using a Cisco Unified Border Element. And uh, you might be going over the IP WAN to do that. So let's go over to that remote site. At that remote site, we've got a router. And that router might be configured as a CUCME, a Cisco Unified Communications Manager Express router. That is a call agent. That is a PBX replacement on a smaller scale. It's like the, uh, it's like the small office version of Communications Manager. It's got a bunch of features. It's not as feature rich as Communications Manager, but it's really good. I mean, it's really, really good uh, for the small to medium sized offices. And within that office, yeah, we can have our phones register with Communications Manager Express locally. We could have our Jabber clients working uh, and they could be registering over the WAN back at the headquarters. And for a trim down or a scale down voice messaging solution, we can have something called CUE, Cisco Unity Express. We're going to be talking about all these components today, so let's take some notes. Starting off, like I said, with the star of the show, the Cisco Unified Communications Manager. First of all, I need to get on just a bit of a rant, if, if you'll pardon me that. Pet peeve. Um, when I started working with this uh, two decades ago, the server was called a Cisco call manager server. That was true for version 3.0, 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3. Then Cisco transitioned from a Windows-based platform to a Linux-based platform. They went to version 4, and they changed the names. The server was then called a Cisco Unified Communications Manager server, not, not call manager. Call manager became a service that ran on the Unified Communications Manager server. So I just kind of get this little uh, inside every time I hear somebody talk about a call manager server. Don't be that guy or, or girl. Please don't call it a call manager server because that has not been accurate for over 15 years. Uh, it is a communications manager server that's running the call manager service. I'm sorry, just a pet peeve. Okay, I'm now off my soapbox about that. 
But Cisco Unified Communications Manager, we kind of call that the PBX replacement. And it's going to be based on a server. And yes, today, most of the time, we're going to be running that as a virtual machine uh, based on something like uh, VMware's ESXi. And the way a call is going to work, extension 2001 sent call signaling up to the communications manager server down to, uh, and said, hey, I'd like to call 2002. And, uh, and that was done via the SIP, the session initiation protocol signaling to say, I want to call this number. And communication manager server says, I know where they are. They registered with me earlier. Let me send them a SIP message. So we send that message down to 2002 and they say, yeah, I'll talk to 2001. And we send me a message back saying, here's what we support. I support this codec. I support this way of doing faxes if we're trying to do faxes. I support this type of DTMF relay. Uh, we, all of our parameters that we support. And we kind of have this negotiation about what are the parameters of the call we're going to be setting up. And once all that's decided, the uh, the communication manager kind of steps out of the way. It's, it's like in a boxing match. You have the referee in the middle between the two boxers and uh, they give them each the rules and they say, okay, box. And the referee steps back and they just kind of go at it. That's what's happening here. The communications manager is stepping back out of the way and now these two endpoints, they're talking directly between themselves, not going through the communications manager. We're talking directly between themselves using a protocol for your notes called RTP, the Real-Time Transport Protocol. That carries the actual voice media, and it also carries our video media if we're doing video calls. And you can see that the packet flow that I've animated for you on screen, it goes directly between those two devices. And I mentioned earlier that we normally don't have just a single communications manager server. It's normally more than one. Well, when we have more than one that share a database of, here's all the phones we know about, here are the gateways we know about, they share this database. And that grouping of communication manager servers that share the database, they're called a cluster. Again, that's going to give us redundancy. If one goes down, another can take over. It's going to give us scalability. Because at the very, very high end, uh, if you have a virtualized communication manager server, top of the line, at best, one server is going to support a maximum of 10,000 IP phones. And you can have four servers doing that within a cluster. So four, you can have 40,000 IP phones register within a cluster. Are you limited to 40,000 phones? I mean, I used to work at Walt Disney World and we had, uh, I think at that time we had like 60 some thousand, well, they're not employees, they're cast members, 60 some thousand cast members at Disney World. If everybody had a phone, that would not even be supported by a single cluster. Can you, the great news is you can have more than one cluster. You can just scale this indefinitely with multiple clusters and you can tie them together with these intercluster trunks. And when you're logging in to Jabber or you're logging, you can actually log in to a phone like this using the display on screen as a user or a user can have a user portal. They can log in. I was showing my daughter how to do this. I said, yeah, if you want to forward this to yourself, actually one day, don't tell her employer, uh, she was going to do the work at our house uh, she, because we've got a pool outside. And it was a nice summer day. She said, uh, dad, can I, can I forward my phone, uh, my business phone to my cell phone so I can go like work out by the pool? And I'm like, yeah, I'll go to this user portal and here's how you set up your call forwarding. So you can log in as a user and do that kind of thing. And instead of having a user database on the communication manager server, which you absolutely can do, by the way, it's a lot more efficient for a company to have just one big database, one big directory of users. Uh, and I, I've asked my students for, for years what they use. Over 90% use Microsoft Active Directory to do that. And they're going to be able to pull or they'll be able to validate user credentials from that centralized repository using LDAP, the Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. We can integrate with that. And like I said, we can communicate with other clusters. We're not limited to that. Or we can communicate with gateways. I mean, what I've talked about so far, we've got two phones within the same environment. What if I want to get out to the rest of the world, out to the PSTN? Well, we can send signaling up to a gateway, like a Cisco router, and it can then communicate out to the PSTN. 
Now that signaling that we're going to be using between the communication manager server and the gateway, it can be one of three things. It can be H.323, SIP, or MGCP. And if, uh, if you're going down the collaboration track that Cisco just released earlier this year, if you look at the blueprint for the collaboration core, the CO core exam, you have to know about all three of those. You, don't have, you have to know how to set up your gateway to work with all three of those protocols. That's something we cover in the, in the course that we're developing for CO core. And then you have to know about the time division multiplexed or the TDM circuit that goes from the gateway, the router, out to the PSTN. It might be a T1 circuit. It might be a T1 circuit configured to act as an ISDN PRI circuit. That's on the exam blueprint. It's been around for decades, but it's on the exam blueprint that Cisco released this year. So we cover that in the course as well. And to talk just a bit more about that clustering, I said we had publishers and subscribers, and I said they all shared a database. Well, here's the deal with that. The publisher has the read-write copy of the database. The subscribers, they just have a read-only copy of that database. And that's going to make things a lot more efficient. We write changes to the publisher and they get pushed out to the subscribers. That way, every subscriber doesn't have to be able to write database changes to every other subscriber. But in addition to that database replication, there's also intra-cluster communication going on. And that means uh, this is real-time data. So I go off hook. Well, everybody in that cluster needs to go that extension needs to know that extension uh, 2001 is now off hook. Well, that kind of information is sent through that intercluster communication which is a which is a full mesh. Now, we're going to talk about one more server and then we're going to take our first Q&A break of the day. So if you've got questions, we'll be doing those I promise very very shortly. But the second big component I want to discuss is Cisco Unity Connection. And I really hesitate to call this a voicemail solution, even though it, it is a voicemail solution, but it can do a lot more than this. You can set up some really advanced call routing rules and menuing systems. There's a lot you can do with Unity Connection. But yes, at its essence, we often think of it as a voice messaging solution in the fact that it can do voicemail. And it's based on Linux. It's going to be running probably in a virtual machine, much like Cisco Unified Communications Manager. And it's not solely designed for a communications manager call processing agent. Remember, we talked about companies had PBXs. The, the university I work for paid $3 million for their PBX. Maybe they don't want to throw that out the window as they're starting to migrate to a Cisco solution. Well, great news. Cisco Unity Connection it can preserve your existing investment somewhat by connecting into your existing PBX. That's right. You can have Cisco Unity Connection work with uh, some PBXs using a couple of different, a couple of different protocols, a couple of different gateways that we won't get into today. Um, but uh, yeah, you don't have to get rid of your PBX right away to start migrating to Cisco Unified Communications. But normally what we think about and what you need to know for the collaboration exam material is how you integrate this with Cisco Unified Communications Manager. Now, technically, there are a couple of protocols that you can use to tie together your Unity connection. Please take some notes on this because I know there's a lot of acronyms. There's a couple of protocols you could use uh, to tie together your Unity Connection voice messaging server with your Cisco Unified Communications Manager server, your call agent. One of those is called Skinny, SCCP. That's the Skinny Client Control Protocol. Uh, to give you just a bit of a history lesson on that, back in the 1990s, Cisco got into the into the, the voice over IP environment by purchasing a company called uh, Celsius Systems. Celsius spelled with an S. And Celsius had a protocol called the, uh, the, the Celsius Client Connection Protocol, SCCP. Well, Cisco bought Celsius and they, they kept SCCP, but they changed the name to the Skinny Client Control Protocol. And that's sort of a Cisco proprietary protocol. And that was really what they focused on in the early years of a communications manager. But now, now they're moving in to a more industry standard signaling protocol. So this is the big one that you need to know about today. I mentioned it already. It's called SIP, the Session Initiation Protocol. And this is an industry standard 
it's uh, it's kind of going to replace SIP. It's going to replace H.323 and MGCP and most of those things. And uh, I would say 90% is going to be SIP here within the next within the next few years. But remember when I said the way you could get more phones to register with a communication manager server, I said our biggest, most powerful, beefy server could support how many? 10,000 phones. And we could have four of those which gave us 40,000 phones that could register. That math does not work with Cisco Unity Connection. Here's what I mean. One server, at a maximum, one server can support 20,000 mailboxes. And you can have as many as two servers in a cluster. Does that mean that you can support 40,000 mailboxes with those two Unity Connection servers? Actually, no. If you have one server, you get 20,000 mailboxes. If you have two servers, you've still just got 20,000 mailboxes. It does not add mailboxes when you add a second server, which begs the question, why do I want to add a second server? A couple of reasons. Reason number one is redundancy. One server goes down, the other server can take over. And there's a couple of protocols you can use to, to, to tie together different different clusters of these. You can use a Cisco proprietary approach called an intersite link, or there's a uh, there, there's something called voice profile for internet mail, VPM. That's an industry standard that will do it. But another reason you might want to have multiple servers in a cluster is that at a maximum, you can have 250 virtual voicemail ports on a server, which means uh, you've got all these users, and from time to time, you're going to have a user checking their voicemail. Now, obviously, not everybody's going to be checking their voicemail at the same time, so you don't need to support 20,000 people checking their voicemail. But at a maximum, you can have 250 users checking their voicemail. You've got 250 ports. Well, if you do have two servers, those ports do add together. So you can have 500 voicemail ports where you can have 500 simultaneous users communicating with your voicemail system. But uh, you don't get extra mailboxes by just adding another server, unfortunately. And it's kind of interesting the way it works when you think about it. You've got your communication or your Cisco Unity Connection server. And let's say we've got this, um, this phone. Let's say my phone is 2002. And I've got a voice mailbox on the Cisco Unity Connection server. And we've got somebody out on the PSTN. If that's me out on the PSTN, I'm, I'm, I'm working from home. If I call the number of the Unity Connection server, it's got a number I can call directly into, then uh, that's a direct routing. I'm going directly to that server. And it sees a call coming in. I'm calling from home. It doesn't know who I am. Uh, unless I configure it to recognize my caller ID, which is a possibility. But if I'm just like your average user calling in, it's going to say something like, you know, welcome to KW Train. Uh, your call is very important to us. Press one for sales, press two for technical support, and so on. We can have this menuing system, this automated attendant. But if somebody calls my phone from the PST, and if I call into my phone, and it rings, and it rings, and it rings for about 10 seconds, which is something we, that timer is something we can adjust. We, we show you how to do that in our course. We can adjust that timer to say, okay, if nobody's answered in 10, sec 10 seconds, they're probably not going to answer. So let's forward the call into the Unity Connection server. Now, we've got another call coming into the very same number on our very same server, but this time, instead of saying, hey, welcome to KW Train, it says, uh, it, it plays my outgoing message. Because it came from my phone, it says, Hi, this is Kevin. I'm not able to take your call right now. Please leave a detailed message. And I'll get back with you as soon as possible. Something like that. How does it know the difference? How does it know that I'm call that the call has been forwarded from my phone versus coming directly into it? Th there's some terms I'd like you to jot down in your notes now. There are three terms. There's Annie, Dinas, and Ardenas. Now, the first one is Annie, A-N-I. A-N-I. That stands for automatic number identification. That's caller ID. When you get a call and you see on the display that this number is calling you, I'm getting a call from extension 5002, that's any information. DNIS information, D-N-I-S, that stands for dialed number information service. That's the number that somebody dialed. So 
In the case of me calling from my home directly into that server, my Annie is my home phone number and my Dennis is the, the Unity Connection server's phone number. But what if I call my office phone from my home phone? It doesn't answer. Gets diverted up to the Unity Connection server. Who's the Annie? The Annie's still me and my home. It's my home phone number. The Dennis is still my office phone. That's the number that was dialed. But my office phone redirected the call up to the Unity Connection server. That's called R Dennis, redirected Dennis, redirected dial number information service. And when Cisco Unity Connection gets that, it says, oh, this was redirected from 2002, which means somebody was trying to call 2002. So I'm not going to play the system greeting. I'm going to play the, the user greeting, the outgoing message for the user at 2002, which is, hi, this is Kevin, leave a message. That's the difference. And there are different types of call handlers that we can configure inside of Unity Connection. There's the system call handler, which is what I've been describing, where the system is going to answer either with the general system message or with a specific user's outgoing message. We could have a directory call handler. Now, if you don't have somebody sitting at like the front desk to uh, say, how can I direct your call? And they, they forward you, you could have a directory where it says, um, yeah, enter the extension you're trying to reach. And I love it. Cisco Unity Connection is so cool about this. It can even recognize names. So it's like, uh, I don't know their number. You can start spelling their last name out on the keypad. And it will like, oh, well, you're trying to reach this person. And oh, yeah, that's it. And, and it will divert you to that person. You can literally look up somebody's number using your keypad. You can even do an interview, which is kind of a cool feature you would use maybe occasionally, you know, where the Unity Connection server calls you and it says, hey, we're planning the company picnic. Um, press one if you would like chicken. <laughs> press two if you'd like beef. Or press three if you'd like vegetarian. And they can collect interview statistics, kind of like doing a survey. Um, I don't see that being used a lot, but hey, it's kind of a cool feature. So that is a look at the, the big player, the, the call agent, the PBX killer, as I call it sometimes, the Cisco Unity Connection, or Cisco Unified Communications Manager, and the voice messaging solution of Cisco Unity Connection. Now, we've been going for nearly an hour here, and again, my apologies if I've not answered your questions, but it's because I don't, I'm, I'm doing this solo. I don't have anybody manning the chats behind the scene. So I've not been able to, uh, to look over and see your questions yeah, coming. We'll in. talk about, um, another, another big player. It's, it's the instant messaging and presence server or IMNP. And this is going to allow us to support our Jabber clients. Notice I've got on screen a laptop running Cisco Jabber, but again, there are options for your phone there there if you've got uh like uh, the android version of carplay you can even do cisco jabber running in your car which is kind of cool but let's talk about a few things we can do with cisco jabber on cisco jabber and, I, and i'll show you an interface uh, in a few moments so you can actually see where that shows up but with cisco jabber you can see if somebody is available or willing to take a call in fact another term for your notes we can say that the willingness the willingness to take a call is the, is presence information. For example, if uh, if I'm off the if I'm on the phone right now and my line is busy and somebody has me as a speed dial on maybe their phone or they have me as a speed dial on Jabber, they're going to be able to see that I'm busy right now. I'm on a phone call, or maybe I'm in a meeting. I just don't want to receive a phone call. You can have, we can configure, and we'll show you how to do this in our, in our course. You can configure a do not disturb soft key. So you press this key and it diverts all of your calls to voicemail coming in. It doesn't even ring. It goes immediately to voicemail. But um, the way we can, uh, or maybe we just have been idle. We've walked away. We're taking a break and there's just been no activity for a while. We might be idle from our computer if we're a Jabber client. There's been no activity on our computer. That can show up as we're idle. Well, that information about whether we're on a phone call or not 
can be sent from communications manager to the instant messaging and present server using SIP. Remember we talked about the SIP protocol? SIP has the very unique ability. H.3 uh, H.323 doesn't have it, MGCP, Scanny doesn't have SIP has the very unique ability to carry presence information. So we can say, yep, they're on a they're on a call right now. Or something else that the IMP, I just thought of this one. Something else that the instant messaging and present server can do. It can even check your uh, your Google Calendar or your Microsoft Outlook Calendar to see if you have a meeting right now. And if you do, it can set your presence to your busy just by checking your calendar. You don't have to do anything. And the way that communication is uh, conveyed or that information is conveyed to your Jabber client, here's a protocol you might want to write down. It's XMPP. XMPP. That stands for Extensible Messaging and Presence Protocol. Extensible Messaging and Presence Protocol. It's how we send instant messages that we'll talk about in a moment. And it's also how we communicate presence information. So presence information, that's one function of Cisco Jabber. And again, we're using the IMP server to do that. We can have that Cisco Jabber client act as its own soft phone, as its own software-based phone. Just like a regular physical IP phone, it can use the SIP signaling protocol to say, I want to call this phone. And uh, we set up the parameters and then we start streaming RTP directly between themselves. Just like I showed you earlier with IP phones, we can do that with Cisco Jabber. Or that soft mo phone mode, what I just described, alternately, we can have it operating in desk phone mode. Let's say we're a customer service agent. And I'm sitting at my, uh, I'm sitting at my computer, I've got the headset on, and I'm ready to look customers up in a database as they call in. But I don't, every time they call in, I don't want it to, I don't want to have to reach over and pick up the phone and do all, I don't want to reach for the phone every time. So what I can do is I can use desk phone mode of my Jabber client and I get to remotely control a physical phone. And the way I do that, another protocol for your notes, we've got a lot of protocols today. Uh, there's one called CTI QBE. I'll give you a moment to jot that in your notes. CTI QBE. That stands for Computer Telephony Integration Quick Buffer Encoding. CTI QBE. Computer Telephony Integration Quick Buffer Encoding. Think of that as a remote control protocol. It's a way that we can tell our phone to go off hook, as an example, uh, or go on hook, or just about any kind of signaling message. And that's sent to the communications manager server, which translates that CTI QBE information into corresponding SIP signaling messages that are sent to the phone that we're controlling. And then, uh, in fact, we can even do something called a split tunnel, where if uh, if my phone does not support video, I can use a protocol called CAST, C-A-S-T, and I can send the video to my computer running Jabber, and I can still have the audio on my phone. It can split those streams between us. Now, of course, we can do instant messaging. It's it's uh, instead of using something like uh, Apple Messages or uh, or uh, there's a lot of messaging clients out there today. This is Cisco's. Uh, Cisco Jabber does instant messaging where you can collaborate with your colleagues. And remember the extensible messaging and presence protocol? Well, the messaging component of that, that lets us do instant messaging. Something else we can do is retrieve voicemail from Cisco Jabber. Because we might have our Cisco Unity Connection server and we're wanting to retrieve voicemail information. We do that using an email protocol. If you're pulling email down from uh, something like your, your Google Mail account, you're probably using the protocol of IMAP. IMAP is going to be uh, SMTP. That's the way we send mail, but we retrieve mail using IMAP or sometimes POP3. But we're going to use IMAP to retrieve not email, but voicemail. It's going to be like audio files that we're pulling down via that email protocol. And we can listen to, to our voicemail right there on our Cisco Jabber client just by clicking. Remember we talked about LDAP having this corporate directory of users? We can query that LDAP server, probably a Microsoft Active Directory server from the people I've talked to. But uh, yeah, probably LDAP uh, or probably Microsoft Active Directory. You can look up users from your Jabber client. And that's just a sampling of the things we can do with Cisco Jabber. Now, I know I threw out a ton 
of protocols in that discussion. So if you want to jot these down, here's one more opportunity. The main signaling protocol that negotiates what codec are we using? Uh, how are we sending DTMF tones? Are we using early offer or delayed offer SIP? Uh, that's using the session initiation protocol. The actual voice and video media is being sent via RTP, the real-time transport protocol. We talked about that remote control protocol, CTI, QBE. We mentioned XMPP that would be used for instant messaging as well as sending presence information. We said IMAP is an email protocol that we're going to be using to retrieve voicemail. And we're going to be using LDAP to look up users in like a corporate LDAP directory. Something else that the, um, that the CL Core Exam Blueprint wants you to know about is different types of IP phones. Now, there is a wide variety. We've got a wide variety of uh, Cisco IP phones. I want to focus on two models that I want you to know specifically for the exam. They're sort of the entry-level phones and the higher level, maybe the executive phones. The entry-level phones, as I would call them, it, that's the 7800 series. And these are they're lower cost. You'll notice that there's no video display. There's no cameras on these phones. It's going to be an audio-only call. But you can have just a single line, maybe something hanging in the break room, or you might have your, your attendant that's taking calls coming in for a variety of offices that they're managing. So you could have as many as 16 line keys on these phones. But uh, yeah, just kind of basic, basic phones. If you want to get, uh, as my daughters say, if you want to get bougie about it, um, you can go up to the 8800 series. With the 8800 series, there's a variety of them. The one I was showing you earlier was the 8865. And it's one of them that not all of them do, but it supports something called intelligent proximity. Uh, later, we're going to be talking about uh, telepresence. That's the immersive experience that you can have with Cisco, uh, where you actually, you're looking at people on these high resolution screens and uh, you've, you've got this CD quality audio. It, it honestly kind of feels like you're right there in the room with them. It's really close. It's not 3D, but other than that, it's almost like you're, you're really there. And a lot of times they'll be sharing a presentation I put like up on the screen. Well, what you can do with intelligent proximity is, uh, let's say uh, you, you've got your, your phone, you're, you're dialed into this telepresence meeting, uh, and you don't want to have to be squinting at your phone screen to see the presentation that's going on. You can have your tablet. It's going to rec uh, your phone is going to recognize that it's in proximity with your tablet, and it's going to mirror the display on your tablet for the presentation that's being given. In fact, you can have, this blows my mind that this is even possible, you have your control of the presentation. So the presenter's on slide 10 and you think, what was slide eight again? You can scroll back to slide eight without interrupting what they're doing because it's being sent to your tablet and your phone will automatically pair up thanks to that proximity feature. Kind of amazing. The video cameras are technically high definition. They're 720p cameras. Now, to be honest, the screens are not 720p. The cameras are. You're sending and receiving at 720p, but the screens, they're not quite 720p, but they're really tiny screens. I think I think that's okay. They're they're still they still still look uh, they still look really 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 good. Uh, let's see. Uh, one other thing, the one I showed you and another model you don't even have to connect them to Ethernet. They're, they're Wi-Fi. You, if you're in a place where you can get power to this phone, you can do it via Wi-Fi. So you can have one of those power bricks and just connect via Wi-Fi. Kind of cool. Now, I want to kind of give you an overview of how a Cisco IP phone can register with a communications manager server. How does this thing boot up? Let's kind of go through the steps. The first thing is it needs power. Now, I've already mentioned that you can get a power brick and there's a place where you can plug in, where you can plug in power in the back. I wouldn't recommend that. You're, you're trying to plug this big power brick into the already overcrowded power strip underneath your desk. A much more elegant way of providing power to this is to do PoE, power over Ethernet. That's where over the Ethernet cable directly, you're getting power for your phone. That's the way I would prefer to do it. And that's coming from your Ethernet switch. And there's like a miniature operating system, uh, a miniature image. That's enough to get the phone booted up and, and doing some basic stuff. Get it talking on the network. And your Cisco Catalyst switch is going to tell your phone 
what VLAN it's a part of. Because something else on the back of these phones, uh, there's a, uh, let's see if I can find it here. Yeah, there's a port. I don't know if you can see it right there. There's a port that your PC can connect into. So you can daisy chain your desktop PC into the phone and then go from the phone into the wall. And it's a best practice for performance, for quality of service, for security, to have your PC and your phone on different VLANs. Which VLAN should your phone belong to? When it boots, when it gets power, your Cisco Catalyst switch can tell it via the Cisco Discovery Protocol or via LLDP, LLDP Med specifically, hey, here's your VLAN, so it knows what VLAN it's going to be using. Then it's going to go out and ask for some IP address information via DHCP. And, and yes, but before you chat it in, yes, I know that DHCP is a four-step process. It's the door of the Explorer process. It's discover offer, request, and acknowledgement. But just for simplicity, I'm saying, we're saying, give me some IP address information and we get it. The, the reason I even bring up DHCP is, in addition to getting, here's your IP address and your subnet mask and your default gateway and your DNS server, we also usually will get IP address information for a TFTP server, a trivial file transfer protocol server. Why? Because when we do our, we go into the GUI interface on our communication manager server and we configure the parameters for this phone. We say, this is your do not disturb button. We get all the, uh, we get all the configuration configured. Where does that configuration file live? It's, a, it's an XML configuration file. Where does it live? On our communication server, which acts as a TFTP server. So the phone is downloading via TFTP its configuration. So it says, can you give me my configuration file? And we get it and we can download other files. There's localization files, like in different countries, things are going to look a little bit different. We might be using different languages, but once we get all those configuration files downloaded from the TFTP server, then we're ready to register. One of the things it gets in that TFTP configuration file is a list of as many as three communication manager servers with which it can attempt to register. So if the first one's not available, it can go for a secondary or even a tertiary server. Kind of nice. Cisco Jabber, we've already talked a bit about it a great deal. Just to give you a, a sense of the variety of the platforms, there is a version, a client version, that can run on Microsoft Windows, on Apple's uh, Mac OS. There's an app for the phone, an app for Android. There's a separate app just for Cisco iPad. Not Cisco iPad, excuse me, Apple iPad. And uh, if you've got Cisco Jabber for Android audio, if you've got Android audio in your car, I haven't seen offer it for CarPlay yet, but uh, I'm hoping that comes soon because I've got CarPlay. I'd love to see that. But uh, yeah, you can even have this thing running in your car. And I was telling you all the things that it would do for you. Here we actually see a Cisco Jabber screen. And you see that there's uh, a chat area. You can click on a button and we'll do instant messaging. You can see different colors like uh, green or sort of orange or red to indicate if somebody is available or busy or away from their desk at the moment. There's a way to listen to our voice messages. Remember, we're going to be using IMAP to pull those down. We've got a button where we can toggle back and forth between soft phone mode where we act as a phone and desk phone mode where we're controlling a physical phone. And we have a bunch of protocols here, again, just to summarize, SIP, call control. XMPP, we've already talked about this, that's going to be used for messaging and presence information. Here's one we didn't mention that, that I'd want you to know for the exam, by the way, and it's, uh, it's SOAP. That's Simple Object Access Protocol. Simple Object Access Protocol. And that's used for, that's for you, oh, when we're logging in to IMP, that login process is controlled with the SOAP protocol. And we've already talked about CTI QBE that's used for remote control. And here's the one that I kind of alluded to. I barely mentioned this one. It's CAST. And uh, th this stands for Cisco Audio Session Tunnel. And this is what can send the video to your Jabber client on your PC and the audio to your phone. So that's a look at Cisco Jabber. And up to this point, we've been talking about having audio and video calls with tons of features available to us, much better than a PBX. But if we really want to feel like we're there, and Cisco calls it an immersive experience, and I've done it, and I've got to say, it really feels immersive, we can look at their telepresence solution. 
they've got a few different things in the telepresence series. Now, many of these are starting to be end of life. They're being replaced with WebEx products. But for the exam, I would like you to know about the SX series. This stands for the session experience. That's what SX stands for, session experience. This is where you can go into a room and you can say, I've already got this TV, we'll use it. I'm going to connect this camera via an HDMI cable to my TV. We'll have this little control thing. I've got a remote. But you're using your own TV, and you can kind of set it up in your room as you want it to. That's the session experience. There's also the meeting experience, where you can have an MX series telepresence device. It might have one screen or two screens, and you just kind of kind of roll it into your meeting room and you're ready to go. You don't have to plug anything into your existing TV or hook up a control panel. It's, it's like an all-in-one, here's your meeting, go. Another option is if somebody's at their desk, but they still want it to be more immersive than just looking at their phone, they can have a larger screen. And this is the DX series. This is the desktop experience. This is running the Android mobile operating system. You can literally load up games and play Android uh, Android games on your uh, Telepresence DX, uh, your DX device on your desktop. All of those three have already been announced as end of sale or end of life, so that's probably not what you're going to be buying in the future. The only one that's not been announced as end of sale or end of life is the iX5000 series. The iX, that stands for the Immersive Experience series. This is where you've got, uh, like, I think there might be 72-inch 4K displays, and there's three of them. It actually comes with furniture. I'm not kidding. You're buying furniture from Cisco. It's this desk that wraps around, and the people at the other side, they might have their own uh, desk that comes from Cisco as well. And it looks kind of like an oval desk once everybody's on the call. And uh, you've got your little iPad type of device in front of you where you can see the presentation and scroll back and forth like I was telling you about. And uh, yeah, CD quality audio, 4K TVs, three of them side by side. It's as close as you can get to feeling like with a telepresence solution as being really there. But I said that a lot of Cisco's telepresence stuff, it was being kind of rebranded and replaced with a WebEx. So now Cisco has a series of WebEx, uh, they have WebEx rooms now, where they have something similar to the, the MX series. You just kind of roll in these screens. Yeah, if you go out and buy one of these today, it's probably going to be part of the WebEx room series. In fact, they announced at Cisco Live, which was virtual this year, they announced at Cisco Live, since so many people are doing like the Zoom meeting things now, uh, if, if you're not using Zoom or if you're using Cisco solution, they've got a WebEx, uh, they've got a WebEx client that sits on your desktop that's optimized for virtual meetings. You, you should go check that out on the website. It's got some pretty cool features. Now, let's take a step back and ask the question, how does that Jabber client out on the internet register with a communication manager server and or an IAM in presence server inside of our company if there's a big firewall in the middle that's blocking them? That's where the Cisco Expressway comes in. Let's say in this enterprise network, we've got this Jabber client inside the, inside the enterprise and they want to register with Communications Manager. So they boot up, much like a physical phone, and um, they download their TFTP configuration file. Or actually, they're probably, since it's a, a Jabber client, they're probably already configured with the IP address or the name of their Communication Manager server. And and they're going to do a request to a DNA server saying, "Hey, can you tell me the uh, can you tell me the IP address of my communication manager server?" And that internal DNA says, "Oh yeah, sure. It's it's this IP address and that Jabber client. It's going to have a direct registration with that internal communication manager server. There's no firewall in between it. Nothing to block it. But let's let's shift our focus out to the internet." We might have a Jabber client there on the internet that wants to get in. How can that work? How can we come in through this firewall? Well, there are two parts to the Expressway solution. There is Expressway C, where C stands for core. It sits in the, it sits in the core of our network. And there's the Expressway E. It sits on the edge of our network, maybe exposed to the internet. Or, or here, I've got it inside of a DMZ. A demilitarized zone, that's a zone in your network where you might want to put servers that are publicly accessible, like your web server, maybe an email server. But it's 
it doesn't give you access to the internal enterprise network. Maybe we put an Expressway e-server there that people can get to from the outside. Well, here's what happens. Ahead of time, the Expressway C server, follow me on this, the Expressway C server, which is on the inside, it's allowed to go out of the firewall because the firewall's trusting people on the inside. It's allowed to go out of the firewall, so it, it goes out of the firewall and talks to the Expressway E server. And it sets up this session. We've now got an open, uh, secured, an open, encrypted communications path between the Expressway C and the Expressway E, and we're going to leave that tunnel open. So we've got this tube, if you will, running between these two servers. So now our Jabber client on the internet says, hey, can I can I resolve the IP address of this communication manager server? And the, the DNS server out on the internet says, no, I don't know where that is. So we try a backup. We say, well, can you get me to this Expressway server? And we've registered that with, the, with our public DNS entries. And we say, oh yeah, I can get you to the Expressway E server. So we have our Jabber client connect to this Expressway E server inside of the DMZ, and we've got that open communication path between the E and the C. So we're just going to flow through that open channel to the Expressway C server on the inside of the network, which is then going to direct us to the communication manager server. And that's how we have somebody on the outside get through the firewall. We call it firewall traversal. And oftentimes the firewall is doing NAT, network address translation. We're doing NAT traversal as well. Now, when you read about this feature provided by the Cisco Expressway, the actual name of the feature is called MRA, Mobile and Remote Access. And it's going to work for Jabber endpoints. It's going to work for your telepresence endpoints. And some, not all, but some models of Cisco IP phones will do that as well. Your Cisco iOS routers been around for a long time. They can play a role in your unified communications network. For example, we mentioned this earlier, they could get us out to the PSTN. I can have a T1 circuit or an ISDN circuit, both of which you have to know according to the blueprint of the CO core exam that we're going to be covering in our course. You're going to be able to have this digital circuit that's going to go out to the PSTN. So the IP phone is going to use a signaling protocol to go to the communications manager, probably SIP, maybe Skinny, probably not, but I, but I included it for completion. It could be a third-party phone using H.323. I don't recommend it. You get almost no features other than you can dial a number. That's about it. So it's probably going to be SIP, maybe Skinny, but probably SIP. We're going to set up a session with our communication manager server and say, hey, I want to call this phone number out on the PSTN, the public switch telephone network. And the communication manager server says, well, based on my route patterns, and there's a whole science we'll be getting into behind route pattern construction, I'm going to talk to my gateway. That's my way to get to that PSTN phone number. And the way we talk to the gateway might be via H.323, MGCP, or SIP. The CL Core Blueprint says we need to know about all three of those. And then we might be going over a PRI circuit, something else we have to know about on the exam. Uh, it could be a T1, an E1, E3, T3, or E1 gets us out to the PSTN. And now we can have this back and forth conversation between an IP phone in the enterprise and this POTS phone, a POTS, that's plain old telephone service. That's a traditional telephony device. We've got this POTS phone out on the PSTN, and we've got this back and forth conversation going. That's one way that the gateway can help us out. The gateway being a Cisco router, we can insert a module or some uh, what look like memory modules sometimes, or a module like I'm showing you here, containing DSPs, digital signal processors. Because some of the work we have to do in the communications world, it, it's it's a pretty heavy lifting. It's it's heavily it's processor intensive. And that's where we're converting back and forth between maybe the G.711 uh, codec and the G.729 codec or setting up a conference call where we're blending multiple call streams together. That's a lot of processor cycles. We probably don't want to burden our communications manager with that. Uh, so we can have digital signal processors that live inside of our gateway and the communication manager can reference those. It can speak to those digital signal processors in our gateway, and it's going to be using Skinny to do that. It's still going to be using Skinny to talk to those, and that's called those are called media resources. And we'll see how to set up those media resources in our CO Core class as well. 
Another way a router can play a role here is acting as a cube, a Cisco Unified Border Element. Now, a Cisco IOS Gateway, as I just showed you, it ties together a voice over IP call leg where we're going to destination IP addresses with a POTS call leg, like we're going out to the PSTN over an analog circuit or a T1 or an ISDN circuit. That, that's a POTS call leg, and it joins those two together. Well, a cube, a Cisco Unified Border Element, it ties together a couple of voice over IP call legs. When would we need to do that? Let me give you some examples. If we want to control the parameters of a session, maybe I want to go from a SIP call leg to another SIP call leg, but one's using a flavor of SIP called, um, called early offer and the other one's using delayed offer, they're kind of speaking a different dialect of the same language. Well, session control can convert between those. We can have it for security because the call is actually being terminated at the cube and re-originated. So somebody from the outside, a bad actor, they're not just going straight through. They're being stopped and then it has to be re-originated. So it can give us some security. It's going to give us interworking, which means that we can have different signaling protocols set up a call. We can be coming in using H.323 and be converted to SIP going out. And we can also do, uh, this could also be a point of demarcation because this is a very, very common way we're going we're to connect out to our internet telephony service provider. So if you connect out to your local telephone company, there's probably a box on the outside of your house uh, where the, the, that local loop terminates and that's called your DMARC. That's where the point of responsibility for maintenance changes from you, unless you pay for inside wiring maintenance, it changes from you to the telephone company. Well, this is kind of a, this draws a line in the sand to say, all right, Mr. And Mrs. ISP or ITSP, if it's from here out, it's your problem. It's from here in, it's my problem. It's acts as a demarcation point. And this could be a physical Cisco IOS router configured as a cube or now We've got a virtual router. I mentioned it earlier, a CSR1000V. We could have a CSR1000V with the appropriate version of Cisco IOS running on it, and it could act as a virtual cube. Now, let me give you a couple of use cases of where we might use a cube. Here, we're connecting out to the PSTN, not because we've got our own T1 or PRI circuits. No, we're going through an IP telephony service provider. So our phone, sent, just like we've been talking about, it's going to send signaling messages to our communications manager, maybe SIP, probably SIP, maybe Skinny, probably not, but possibly H.323 to say, I want to call this phone down on the PSTN. Communications manager looks at its route patterns and says, all right, we need to go to the cube. That's our next hop to get there. So we send it over to the cube. And the cube, um, and we're going to talk to the cube using either Skinny, or excuse me, not Skinny, either SIP or H.323. And it's almost in all cases, I'll say nine times out of nine times out of nine, it's going to be using SIP to talk to the IP telephony service provider. And the IP telephony service provider, the ITSP, it's its responsibility to have the T1s and the ISDN and all the circuits going in to your telephone central office. But once that signaling information comes back, now we can have this direct communication between the IP phone on the inside of our enterprise with this analog phone out on the PSTN. We're staying IP all the way from the phone to some service provider out there in the cloud, and they're converting it into the traditional type of telephony signaling. Another option is, or another use case, is where you've got a remote site. Maybe you've got Branch Office One and the headquarters. You, uh, it's a, we start the same as we always did. We send our message into the communications manager saying, hey, I want to call 3001. And our communications manager says, well, my route plan says that's at the BR1 site. Uh, based on that, I want to be using this codec and uh, we'll talk about regions and codecs and how we handle other sites in our course, but we're going to send signaling over to the cube and the cube is going to say, all right, maybe, maybe communications manager talk to the cube using SIP, but maybe that site over uh, at BR1, maybe they're using H.323 to talk to us. That's called interworking. We can convert between those and we can, even though we're using different signaling protocols in those different sites, 
because the cube is doing that interwork, not internetworking, interworking, it's doing that translation, we can have an end-to-end -end call going between, in this case, extension 2001 at our site and extension 3001 over at the branch office. And that's a look at the cube, the Cisco Unified Border Element. Now let's talk about that remote office for a moment. How do those phones at the remote office get to a, a call agent? They could use the WAN. They could register over the wide area network with our centralized communications manager server. That's an option. Or they could use their own Cisco Unified Communications Manager Express. Or maybe there is no huge headquarters. Maybe this is just a small to medium-sized office. We've got, a, we've got one location. We've got 300 employees. We don't need a Communications Manager server. We, all we need is a Cisco Unified Communications Manager Express. And uh, the Communications Manager Express, it can be based on a router, or we can even do it virtually. Uh, and if you use the virtual client, you run this as a virtual machine at a maximum, it can support as many as 450 phones registered and as many as 113 simultaneous phone calls. And like Communication Manager, it's going to be handling our call processing. It's going to speak skinny or SIP that the phones can use to register or set up calls. And it works much like Communications Manager does. Once it negotiates the parameters between the calls, now instead of having a route pattern, we're going to have a series of what are called dial peer statements. We're going to get into dial peers in the course as well. And once the call is set up, just like with Communications Manager, we've got this RTP stream going directly between these two phones. We can't, we're not limited to just staying there in that router though. We can certainly get out to the rest of the world. We could have uh, we could have uh, T1 interfaces in our router that get us out to the PSTN. Or, or we could even connect out to the internet, uh, maybe via a VPN and get to an IP telephony service provider. If we want to connect back to a communications manager big cluster running at the headquarters, we can do that. We can uh, send SIP or H.323 and have this relationship with a big communication manager cluster back at the headquarters and what about voicemail or voice messaging to be more, more specific? We could, we absolutely could use Cisco Unity Connection back at the headquarters, but we could keep it local. Or again, maybe we're a 300 user office or a 200 user office. I, I don't need a big Cisco Unity Connection server. We could use Cisco Unity Express as our voicemail solution that we'll talk about in just a moment. And you can manage, because it's a router, you can certainly go into the command line interface and say, uh, dial, peer, uh, dial peer VOIP 1. Yeah, you can do all that via the command line. Or there's a really, really nice graphical user interface that makes it really easy. And finally, let's talk about the voicemail solution or voice messaging, because it does more than voicemail, for that small to medium-sized office. And it's called the Q, the Cisco Unity Express. It does do voicemail for us. It's a voicemail server. But in those smaller offices, that's where you might need an auto attendant, somebody that's virtually answering the phone like, hey, you've reached KW Train. If you know your party's extension, press this. You want to go to sales, press this. We can have this menuing system that plays out to callers coming in. And we can even do something, uh, well, we can have this interactive voice response where we kind of navigate people through layers and layers of menus. I know that can be frustrating if you're trying to trying to get to technical support somewhere or press one for this or press two for this. We can have we can have these hierarchical structures. Uh, in fact, we we can. Uh, there's a programming interface that we have where we can drag and drop. It's like object-oriented programming. And you can create this very complex structure for your IVR system. And this could be a module that you insert in your router. Uh, the, the way Cisco used to do it commonly is they would have an actual spinning hard drive on a module. And you would slide that in the back of your router. Or the ones that I would normally buy because I was doing it in smaller environments. I would buy a module. It was a daughter board. And I would open up the router and I would physically plug it on top of the motherboard and it would have flash storage. And that's where everybody's voicemail boxes would live. But now 
with, with the advent of all these virtual machines, you can have a VQ. This is a virtual uh, version of Cisco Unity Express. I can run on a virtual machine. So that, my friends, is a look at, uh, at the big players in a Cisco Unified Communications Network.